Well, we'll uh, go ahead and uh, get started back where we uh, ended last week. And so if you'd like to turn with me, uh, turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Uh, last week we started uh, our study on the uh, Lord of hosts, uh, the God's position as a Lord over his, uh, his angels, his armies, his people. And uh, tonight uh, we're going to begin to look at, uh, as last week we looked at the angels themselves, the host itself. Uh, tonight we're looking at uh, the Lord of that host. Uh, and to start off, I'd like to look at um, just a little bit more about the host uh, and, and how uh, and what, what that host is. And, and specifically, I want to look at uh, the uh, member from among the host who first fell from uh, and dissembled from God's, uh, from God's calling on him. And uh, so with that, we're uh, just going to look briefly at uh, the fall of Satan and his angels. In Ezekiel 28, in verse 14, we read, Thou art the anointed cherubim that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that, thou may, that they may behold thee. And so here we have a, a, an account of a cherubim, a high cherubim, one of, as we saw last week, the covering cherubims that stood immediately at the presence of God and uh, ministered to him there, uh, that he fell from that status before God, uh, that he sinned greatly. Uh, it says that he was perfect in every way, uh, just as God had created him to be until the day that iniquity was found in him, sin. And so he was cast out. Isaiah 14 gives a similar account of this. I fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Uh, this angel uh, sinned greatly against God, and his sin was to exalt himself above God, was to see himself because of uh, his, the beauty that he was made with, the, the worth that he was made with. He says that I will ascend, I will exalt myself, I will sit on the mount of the congregation, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. He says, I will be like the Most High. Uh, his sin that he committed was to think of himself as greater than the Lord of hosts. God is above him, God possesses him, God owns this uh, angel, the, the covering cherubim. And yet the covering cherubim, the one that was supposed to bear up the throne of God, as we saw last week, his sin was to exalt himself above God, to think of himself as being on par with God. And so when, uh, as we looked at last week a little bit, uh, it, when we study the angels, we should never think uh, of them as primary. We should never think of them as uh, more worthy to receive our attention and our uh, adoration than God is. In fact, they are unworthy of any of it. Uh, we should only give praise and glory to God himself. And this is a sin that many people have fallen into over the years, the worship of angels, giving them more attention than 
God himself. In fact, Satan's uh, next move after sinning against God in this way was to begin to corrupt other angelic beings in this way. In Matthew 25, 41, we read about the devil and his angels, that, that the devil has his angels, that they followed after him. In Revelation 12, verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was there found any more in uh, place any more in heaven and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and satan which deceiveth the whole world he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him so the the dragon satan uh, this covering cherub that he warred against god in heaven uh, he warred against the angels of God, him and his angels with him, and they were cast out of heaven. So his uh, influence in that, his, his uh, sin that he first committed was to think of himself as greater than God, and then was to deceive others that he, the covering cherubim, was greater than God, and, and ra not rather a servant of to God, made for his glory. And then even further, he wasn't content just to deceive his fellow angels like this, but to deceive humanity in the same way also, to exalt themselves above God. In Genesis 3, 1, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And later he says, for in the, he, the Lord knoweth that in the day ye eat thereof, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Uh, he deceived them to take on themselves this, uh, this privilege of taking what was not theirs to take, to, to become gods unto themselves. And in verse 14 of Genesis Three, the Lord said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And again, not only Satan began to corrupt humanity in this way, but his angels also corrupted. In Genesis 6, we read about how the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And in Jude, 1, verse, Jude verse 6, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, hath he reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about, about them in like manner gave themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Uh, the angels that followed Satan, Satan's angels, they did likewise. They deceived in the days of Noah and they further deceived in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah and they continue now to deceive in the same way. So when we look at the angelic host and the, the, the host of the Lord in heaven, if we are focusing on them and, and having uh, an exhaustive knowledge of them and their ways and are ignoring the Lord of the hosts, then we're in sin. That's, in fact, an aspect of the first sin that was ever committed was in the worship of angels, namely Satan's self-worship, and then his angels which followed him, their worship of themselves and their worship of Satan. And then finally in the garden when Adam and Eve were taught to self-worship by an angel, that is where sin uh, originated from. And so uh, as we looked last week at uh, all of the glories of the angelic host, uh, the armies of God, we should now turn and look at the Lord of the host himself and his supremacy over them. And so let's do that. Uh, turn to Daniel chapter 7 with me. 
Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7 verse 9. The scripture says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down. That is, all of the powers of creation. All other thrones were cast down. And the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, a thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. So in the ancient of, of days, God himself, all other authorities being cast down, nothing to stand up to him. He stands and is ministered to by multitudes in heaven, and he sits to judge all of them. All those that came up against him, all those who serve him, he stands above them to judge between them what will be done with them. He commands all of the armies, all of the hosts, the congregation of heaven. By his power, then also, he destroys his enemies. He doesn't need a great host to achieve this. In 1 Samuel 15, we read that Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me unto thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Uh, by his authority, he sends out, he, he claims his authority. He says the Lord of hosts does this, the Lord of the heavenly host. And he says, go out and smite Amalek. And so he, he does exercise this authority to send his armies, and in this case to send a king of Israel out to, uh, to do this work. Uh, he is the Lord of all armies, of all people, and he commands what he wills to be done. But he himself does not need his host. Uh, he could do all of this himself. Uh, turn to Psalm 68 and verse 15 with me. Psalm 68 verse 15. The scripture says, The hill of God is as the hill of Bashan, in high hill as the hill of Bashan. Why leap ye, ye high hills? This is the hill which God desireth to dwell in. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The, the host of the Lord, the army of God, thousands and thousands of angels. But it says the Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. Thou, speaking of God, thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Blessed be the Lord, who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation, Selah. So he has thousands of angels, a whole host of armies, but the psalmist says, the Lord has ascended on high. The Lord led captivity captive. The Lord received gifts for men that uh, even for the rebellious to dwell with the Lord. Uh, the Lord of hosts is so far surpassing all of his hosts that he doesn't even need them. He uses them. He sends them out to do his will for his glory, but he doesn't even need them himself. 
this is, of course, speaking about an al uh, in, in, in allegory about how Jesus Christ defeated all of the spiritual powers for us and how one day he will come and destroy uh, all the enemies of God in a full sense, uh, that he will achieve this victory. Uh, in Job 40 and verse 15, we even are given a glimpse at two spiritual powers that uh, are higher than all other created spiritual powers, and yet God is greater than them. The scripture says, Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee. He eateth grass as an ox. Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force in the navel of his belly. He moveth, moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief in the ways of God. That is the chief of, of the host of God, of the created spirits that God has made. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food where all the beasts of the field play. So his might his, his strength is showed to us, his, his power being chief in the ways of God, in, in his army, and yet he that made him is able to make his sword to approach unto him. They're even uh, of the, the highest of these angelic beings, cannot approach to God. Even Satan, the anointed cherubim that covers it speaks in Job 41, verse 1 of him. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? And in verse 8, lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? He says, Leviathan, which we know is Satan, described in Revelation and uh, in Isaiah 27, that he is mighty. Uh, it says, who dares to stir up Satan? Uh, it, his fierceness, and yet he says, who is able to stand before me? Just as behemoth, God has made him. God is able to make his end draw near to him. In Isaiah 27, 1, In that day the Lord with his sore and great strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. He uh, is greater than, than even Satan himself, uh, that high and anointed cherubim, uh, the only uh, the, the first created being, rather, that uh, began to think in his own heart that he could rival God, uh, standing in his presence continually. And yet, Leviathan, Satan, is not even as a thought to God. Uh, the Lord will destroy him uh, without even trying uh, on that day. And so, uh, the Lord is greater than them. And it is the Lord that protects his own people in Psalm 68 and verse 20 again. Psalm 68, verse 20. He is our God, who is the God of salvation. Uh, and unto God, the Lord, belongeth the issues of death. But God shall wound the head of his enemies, and the hairy scalp of such an one as goeth on still in his trespasses. The Lord said, I will bring again from Bashan. I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea. Remember Leviathan again from the sea, from the dominion of Satan. That thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies, and the tongue of thy dogs in the same. The Lord will do this. He will go and conquer the enemies of his people by himself without his hosts having to do anything. He will go out and defeat them 
so that, as it says, the foot may be dipped in the blood of those that hate us and our, even our dogs, uh, the same. Uh, you know, even those that, uh, that we don't give a, a second thought to in this. So the Lord uh, saves his people, delivers his people by his own strength. And finally, I'd like to look at that Christ is the Lord of the hosts with the Father. Uh, in Matthew 26, 53, which we read last week, Jesus says, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. Uh, they are at his disposal, at Christ's disposal. He can pray the Father, and they will be sent under his command. In Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, including all power above angels, above the host of the Lord. They are his to do as he pleases. In Colossians uh, 1, verse 14, In whom we have redemption through his blood, in Christ, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers or things present or, 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 or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Uh, it mentions a few things there, dominions, principalities, powers, all things, thrones. And this is, uh, these are phrases that are used in the scripture to talk about spiritual powers, about the angelic host, whether they be the host of the Lord or the host which dissimulated with Satan. Uh, Ephesians 6 1 says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, those same terms being used of our enemies in, uh, the, uh, in the spirit, uh, that these were made by Christ that he has authority over them, uh, that they were made for him to glorify his power and his authority. And it is by Christ's power that even the king of darkness is thrown down. Revelation 12.10 says that the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Christ is the Lord of hosts. Christ is the one that uh, stands before the thousand times a thousand. Uh, all of the host of heaven. Uh, that to him is all uh, authority. All other thrones are cast down before him uh, and he has redeemed us by this and this is what I want to look at last in this study together is that we as Christ's saints redeemed to him are a host to the Lord not only the angels in heaven but also Christ's family here on earth that we are his host his people that he's redeemed and called out and who he has authority over. We are bought with Christ's blood. Hebrews 2.9 says, We see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it, be for it became him, for whom are all things, and by, uh, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. 
For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. By his death on the cross, he's redeemed us. We were corrupted by Satan, and he, laying Jesus Christ, laying down his life, laying aside his glory for us, he came and was made perfect through suffering and became the captain of our salvation, our uh, Lord, the Lord of hosts. By his spirit, we are sanctified and empowered to serve as hosts before him. In Acts 1.8, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We serve that same role as witnesses, as messengers that we saw in the angelic host last week, that they serve God in, in this way, to, to go out into the world, to proclaim the gospel to all. And uh, we all know that just as the angels serve before the Lord, we serve before the Lord. Uh, we offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving, as the scripture says. We come together and we uh, glorify God together and, and uh, encourage one another in him, in his household. And in Christ, we also serve as a spiritual army. And on the last day, the army that will come with him. In Jude verse 14, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He says the Lord comes with his saints with all of them in his judgment, we uh, follow after him. In Revelation 19 and verse 6, then, if you'd like to turn there with me. Revelation 19 and verse 6. The scripture says, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they that are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Uh, the saints of the Lord, those whom he has redeemed, his bride, it says it was given to her to make herself uh, ready, to, to, to be arrayed in these fine linen, clean and white, the righteousness of saints, which is the righteousness that Christ gives to his saints. And in verse 11, it tells us about what these will then do on that day when Christ comes. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written which no man knew, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So when Christ comes, the Word of God, he comes in his power, to judge the world, we will come with him as his host. The Lord of hosts will bring all of his household with him, both of the angelic variety and the human variety. We will all be brought together with him to this day of, uh, of battle, of his, his coming and redeeming the world to himself. But again, I'd like us to know right here at the end, is that Christ here 
is the only one who prevails. He comes with us. He brings his armies, his host with him, and he brings them so that they will witness what he does, how he judges. In verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He goes out by his sword. It doesn't mention that we go out and we fight, but he goes out before us. He's redeemed all this host for himself, a mighty army. And yet he is the one that goes out and he treads the winepress of God's wrath and he judges by the word of his mouth. And so in in all of this, uh, what we should see is God has redeemed a great company, a great host. And yet it's all for his glory. It's all for, for his name's sake. Whether we look at the angels and we read about them in the scripture uh, and, and, and their might, we should be reminded of the Lord and how great he is. Or whether we see how strong a people, how mighty spiritually that he is redeemed in Christ on the earth, we should remember that it was God that saved them, that God, it is God who will secure them an eternal place of dwelling. And so we should uh, all be reminded to look to, towards him in all this. And so uh, uh, with that, I just pray that we would, we would take that with us as we go into study. And uh, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you and we thank you for uh, your word, Lord, that you give to us. Uh, Lord, we thank you for... Uh, the love that you showed to us and uh, in that you've done all the work for us, Lord, uh, that we're uh, simply receiving from you uh, your salvation, your promise of uh, a future, Lord. And Lord, we pray that you would use us to help uh, in spreading the gospel to the world. Lord, we pray that you would be with those that couldn't be here tonight with us, Lord. Uh, help them and give them comforts. Lord, we pray for uh, the McKinney family, Lord, and we pray that you would help them in this time of grief. And Lord, especially we pray that Jesus Christ would be brought out to them. Lord, that they would uh, see the gospel, hear it, and uh, Lord, that they would believe on it and be saved. Lord, we pray that uh, you would be with us in this church and comfort us. And we pray that you would send Christ quickly uh, to bring us back and reunite us with uh, all of your people, Lord. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.